Prime Minister, it's great to have you on Talk with World Leaders and very welcome to Beijing. Thank you for having me. Now, Prime Minister, as we speak, we know there is a humanitarian crisis going on in Gaza and our foreign ministers just made a statement regarding the situation calling for secession of fire. What is your opinion of what is going on? It's an appalling act. Uh, rather, it is the reminiscent of barbaric medieval act, mm. even probably more severe than that. It is this morning what happened, uh, but the, oh, I mean, I'm referring to the attack on the hospital and in the manner mm. the children and women and the injured have been targeted. Mm. It's a tantamount to war crime, and I, I personally feel the officials who are involved in this should be treated that way, war criminals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's utterly, totally unacceptable mm -hmm. to the norms and values of 21st century. You, you cannot uh, go with impunity with such a behavior, be it anyone, State of Israel or anyone else for that matter. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think is the solution? What should the international community do? First of all, the cessation of, of uh, uh, at, at the moment, uh, and then creating a human uh, assistance corridor, where at least you ensure the supply of food, water, mm. uh, medicine, and once you create a semblance of, of normalcy, which is uh, so challenging even to assume and think about it at this stage, but this is the prerequisite. And then we will talk about the short-term or the mid-term or the long-term solutions. I mean, there are many and, and many players have different positions on that. But at the moment, uh, Pakistan is not uh, interested in the long-term solution or having discourse around that. At the moment, we need to protect the innocent uh, civilian Palestinian lives. And that is of utmost urgency. Would you please share with us the main development and achievement of CPEC for Pakistan. Let me remind you when uh, we initiated this around 10 years back, along with our Chinese uh, partners, uh, the world was projecting Pakistan to either become a dysfunctional or a failed state. Mm -hmm. And in that milieu, in that environment, the BRI initiative comes, it mm -hmm. intervenes, it intervenes, it offers an opportunity to us to develop our infrastructure, to add to our energy sector, mm -hmm. and all that was primarily an impetus uh, to our economic growth. Uh, the province from which I come, uh, Balochistan, uh, we developed one of the most important port, the Gwadar port over there. Mm -hmm. uh, we did develop its connectivity with the mainland Pakistan, and we are expecting that a huge transformation of that region, uh, mm. which would be people-centric, people uh, creating more jobs for people, integrating them socially, economically, politically, with the rest of the country. Mm. It was a win-win situation for Pakistan and China both. Mm. Uh, we are anticipating and focusing on the second phase of CPAC, which is the flagship uh, project of BRI and uh, we, we are realizing that it's a grand opportunity which probably once comes in centuries mm. and, and it's a, that big leap which Pakistan's economy needs, that leap, that jump, that big push uh, would come through the initiative of BRI. Now so looking at the broader picture, what is the significance of the Belt and Road Initiative for Pakistan? How do you look at its prospects? Uh, but to me, it seems uh, that this uh, Chinese transformation uh, of almost, uh, which started uh, four decades back, mm -hmm. and its path and journey towards the modernization is offering a unique opportunity to the Chinese society itself mm -hmm. and uh, the connected region in which, of course, Pakistan has a very uh, primacy role and that important role is uh, bringing us more close and uh, this transformation will not just limit between China and Pakistan. I see uh, multiple uh, north-south routes, uh, rail networks, road networks, mm -hmm. and broadening and enhancement of Chinese economic influence. 
Chinese mm -hmm. political influence, uh, which is uh, for the larger global stability, it's one of the most and key uh, factor which would be determining uh, the politics of future, the economics of future, and even the civilizational questions in future. And this time your trip to Beijing and how is it? What's your first impressions? Well, this is my first ever visit to China. Mm -hmm. And I was utterly and completely mesmerized. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a, a frequent visitor to the European continent, to the American continent, but unfortunately I didn't mm -hmm. have the chance, uh, which, is, which is a shame that I had never been to China. Uh, but as soon as I landed in Beijing, I just started comparing uh, that what sort of uh, material advancement and, and, and economic growth which, which uh, you do see as a, a symbols in its building, in its road infrastructure, in its uh, movement of automobiles on the road, so on and so forth. Uh, I was speechless. I never expected uh, that such an impressive uh, journey has been taken by, by China and unfortunately I, I had never witnessed that but I'm glad uh, that eventually I did it. I did not miss uh, this observation and I'm taking back this impression back home and mm. uh, that impression uh, would, uh, would transform me as the biggest ambassador to Pakistan-China's friendship. If you too describe your first impressions of Beijing in three words perhaps what would you what would you say about Beijing about China dignified huge self-confident that's how I would describe Beijing and probably when I see more of China the rest of China I understand you will also be meeting with some local Chinese entrepreneurs this time and you're going to Urumqi, that's on your agenda. As far as the, my visit to Urumqi is concerned, I'm very much excited. I'm probably the first ever head of a government who would be visiting that region. And uh, there, it is very close to the northern part of Pakistan. And we have a few projects which would be linking uh, through roads uh, the, and, and it would be actually the revival of old Silk Road and that is the part and area which is on the Pakistani side and it would be connecting directly itself with Urumqi and Xinjiang and uh, uh, we uh, expect a lot of trade and economic activity on, on that front. We do anticipate that there would be a new wave uh, in the area of tourism between China and Pakistan. Uh, for instance, we have got a lot of the development of the relations between China and Pakistan over the years? Uh, this is one of the closest, one of the most valuable, uh, one of the most desired on the part of both the parties, a, a relationship which uh, both the countries value so deeply. Uh, right. We have been using metaphor of Iron Brothers and, mm. and uh, more uh, uh, it's m uh, uh, more uh, 
uh, strengthened in the heights of Himalayas and so on and so forth. Mm. But even these metaphors, I think so, have not I have not touched upon the essence of the relationship which actually we enjoy. It's, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, which is? What's the essence? I think so. The essence is that Pakistan and China are quite uh, essential. Uh, they are uh, intertwined, mm -hmm. uh, though two different countries, two different nations, but at the time, uh, to me, it seems that it's like one nation moving in a single direction. Mm -hmm. This is that sort of closeness which I personally feel we have. Now we know uh, China and Pakistan have been stepping up efforts in cooperation in the areas of green energy, environmental protection. How would you evaluate the measures by the two governments in uh, making these things happen to combat climate change? Uh, Pakistan is uh, one of the victims of climate change, as you know, that we suffered uh, last year one of the worst hit floods. Uh, uh, ten years back, probably in 2010, yes, 2010, we, we had that sort of episode earlier also. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, there are anticipation by the experts that climate change would become an existential threat, uh, not just to the state of, of the society of Pakistan, but at broader level, mm -hmm. one of the most important national security challenge would be from climate change. So climate change has to be viewed with altogether a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the economics uh, will determine uh, our policies on climate change mm -hmm. or there has to be a value system which would be revolving around the idea of climate change. This mm -hmm. is the discourse which we need to have mm -hmm. in a very candid and open manner, mm -hmm. uh, not just with our, our Chinese counterparts, mm -hmm. but we can take uh, this co discourse at the multilateral forums around the globe. and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you cannot respond in isolation to the challenges of climate change, be it Pakistan or China or any other country which feels mm. uh, that they would respond to this challenge on their own. Uh, mm. In my opinion, uh, it would be s uh, a sort of a self-deception and, and sooner we come out of that would be better. So we need to have global partners on that. We know Pakistan is an important player in regional security. So how does it handle relationships with China, the US, and Russia, the major players? We do have divergent views on the security matters and challenges uh, when it comes to the United States of America. Mm. Uh, we do uh, feel that at times there is a deep desire on the part of Western Hemisphere, led mm. by one or two countries, or the bloc of countries, mm. to limit uh, the transformation and modernization and what they would term as a rise of China. And uh, to Pakistan, uh, this rise is natural. The outcome of this rise is inevitable. It has already risen. Mm -hmm. uh, and no power on earth can undo that rise. Mm -hmm. So the correct approach to handle that would be to coordinate with China rather than contain China. Uh, we strongly believe in that, we do advocate that, and mm. we do express it in a very candid manner, mm. be it in Beijing or in Washington. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, there are some commonalities uh, when it comes to the security issues, counterterrorism challenges with the United States, and we have been coordinating and cooperating with the rest of the world along with China in a very uh, responsible manner. Pakistan is the uh, mm. frontline state who has suffered uh, utmost uh, at, as, as a victim of terrorism and we have lost almost 90,000 people mm. in fighting that war. Mm. And that war was a global war. It was not just the war of Pakistan which we initiated mm. on our own mm. or which we are trying to conclude on our own. So there are convergence in certain areas and there are uh, divergent views on when it comes to the security. Pakistani Foreign Minister Bilawar Bhutto Zadari went to India. What are the considerations behind his visit? I think so. Uh, Pakistan uh, consistently for last many years uh, or probably mm. more than a decade or two uh, has exhibited its intent uh, for a peaceful neighborhood. Mm. Uh, Pakistan has been uh, 
sending the signals, the right kind of messages on different occasions. Just look at the recent murder of a Sikh dissident on the Canadian soil. Uh, this is unprecedented, uh, where the state institutions have been accused of a murder, and state like India, which which uh, flirts with the Western Hemisphere uh, to offer itself as a tool uh, for their so-called Indo-Pacific uh, policy, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I feel that Pakistan uh, has a very deep and, and complex challenge from the Indian side, despite our, our continuous attempts and efforts, uh, we are not being reciprocated in the same manner. Uh, the desire of peace on the other side mm -hmm. seems to be an elusive idea, and we have to wait uh, for that moment mm -hmm. uh, where it is realized that actually that is the answer and only answer to the uh, panacea and, and problems and challenges of this region. And therefore, what plans does your government have in order to ease border tensions and promote regional peace and security? Would you be holding high-level talks with India, for example, in the near future? Well, I do not see at the moment that we have that kind of milieu uh, where we do initiate such talks, but if mm. an opportunity uh, is given, if, if such an opportunity rises, Pakistan will not miss that opportunity. We will mm. seize that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, we do look for peace, but peace with justice. Mm. Uh, and in order to ensure that justice, the old uh, issue of Kashmir, uh, we feel if it is not resolved according to the aspirations of the Kashmiri people, and in the framework of United Nations Security Council resolution, uh, it would be unthinkable uh, to either have some meaningful dialogue with, with our uh, Indian counterparts or uh, a framework where normal trade or economic activity could be encouraged mm -hmm. as it is the biggest impediment. Uh, two major powers, nuclearly equipped, uh, with a huge population directly of around quarter to two billion people. Uh, how do uh, you foresee, if God forbid, uh, such escalation occurs, which leads us to a hot pursuit, uh, would be unthinkable, not just for the region, but beyond. And finally, how do you think the international community could and should do to help with the Kashmir issue? I think the first of all, the international community needs to stop doing cherry picking. Mm. Uh, the conflicts, uh, the violence, that has to be taken according to the moral positions and principles rather than uh, strategic choices. Mm. If you design your policy on strategic choices rather than principles, then those sort of cherry picking uh, further and amplifies the sense of injustice around the world. Sure, and that seems to be a, a broad principle that can be applied in many situations, no cherry picking, and yep. rely on the principles. Yes, exactly. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you. Prime Minister, it's great to have you on our show. Thank you for sharing all your insights. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much.